I hope that was helpful. Um, I want to talk about communication because it's what I'm absolutely, totally, 120 million percent passionate about and it's what 120 million percent of you want for your child. Communication isn't just about wants and needs. It's about expressing love and fun. It's about doing some schoolwork. <coughs> and it's about trying out new things to get my messages across and all the different things that I can say. And that there are ways I can get those magic, amazing things out of my head to other people. Now, if you have a look at what Jake needs in order for him to be a successful communicator, it's an arm wrap to stop the associated movement, significant arm weights to help him weigh down his body and give him proprioceptive feedback, and only then can he use his AAC. But that's not his only AAC system, because you don't spend your whole day like this. Communication, says Janice Light, is the essence of human life. It's about touching other people and about having our lives touched by others. Communication is what builds relationships. We cannot have meaningful, reciprocal relationships without communication. We can be looked after, we can have our nappies changed and we can be taken to the mall, but I can't touch other people's lives the way I want to unless I can communicate more than more and finish. So have a think. If this is what we're focusing on as speech pathologists, teachers, are we meeting that idea that communication is the essence of your child's life, of our lives? Where are we focusing our energy? This or that? What are we telling our children, either explicitly or inadvertently, is important? Okay. Communication 101. Everyone can learn to communicate. Everyone can, can learn to communicate better. It's never too early. If you've got a baby, brilliant. It's never too late. If you've got a 65-year-old, Brilliant. It's never too late. You have not missed the window. You start today on a better path, but you have not missed a window. Some of us need assistance to communicate better. I have tried so long to teach my mother how to do predictable text. <laughs> I will not give up. She's just on a longer journey than my sister and I were. I want to talk about this. This is probably what's on most of your children's forms. It's what is in classrooms. It's what we describe children as. And when people hear it, they assume he cannot or does not talk babble, use his voice in any way, he cannot understand speech and he cannot communicate. There are very, very few people with Angelman who are non-verbal, who do not talk in some way, babble in some way, use their voice in some way. To assume this because of that label is not fair. People see nonverbal and they assume intellectual disability. They assume low functioning. If a child is babbling, they assume high functioning. If a child has a couple of words, they assume high functioning. If a child has babbling maybe on the, when the stars align three times a year, when dad's lying on them do, during WWF, well, mm, it's not consistent, so you're low functioning. The use of nonverbal and the assumptions that people make directly impacts on how they view the child, communicate with the child, and what interventions they are willing to try. 
So if we're going to abandon nonverbal, what else can we use? This is it. Complex communication needs. I want you to say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Complex communication needs. Right. What do we mean by it? Well, the literature says when an individual is unable to use speech to meet their communication requirements given their age and culture or when gestural speech or written communication is inadequate to meet all their communication needs. That's what the literature says. It's come from the International Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication, which is known as ISAAC, brilliant website. Brilliant um, conference every two years. The previous terms that you might have heard, severe communication disorders, severe, severe communication impairments. The currently preferred term is complex communication needs. And it's, it's preferred and it's desired and it's perfect because it focuses us on identifying what is important for the child. Why should we use this term instead of the other one? Because this term doesn't apply doesn't do anything, doesn't tell us anything about the child or what they need. It does not support the individual with Angelman to get the support they need and it does not empower you as parents to advocate for your child's complex communication needs. If you walk up to a speech therapist and say, my child's nonverbal, that tells them a different message than if you can say, you know what, my child has complex communication needs. And the reason that we're using complex communication needs is because people who have complex communication needs have decided this is what they want us to say. People with cerebral palsy, people with multiple sclerosis, this is what they have wanted us to say. So that's what we're using. Why should we use this when we're talking about people with Angelman? Why is it important that we say complex? because we can start then thinking about it's complex, it's complicated, there's more to it than what we think, there's more to it than not being able to talk. It's about receptive communication, what we're putting in. It's about expressive communication, what the child is expressing. It's about access, how is the child going to communicate? If we're going to give them an alternative method, how, how are they going to access it? It's about their sensory issues. If I'm a wiggly, wiggly, jiggly kid, I'm going to have different sensory issues, access issues and expressive requirements than a kid who is, has se severe cerebral palsy and cannot move anything. It's about processing issues. I have complex communication needs. I have complex processing issues. I might not be able to understand if you talk really fast to me. I might need you to slow down and use something like symbols because it's not because of my intellect, it's because I have processing issues. I have so much else going on in my body that if you just start barking instructions at me, I don't understand. It all just turns to gobbledygook. Day-to-day -day changes. We all know the kids are consistently inconsistent and that's okay. Day-to-day -day changes. It's individual and it's multiple, multiple modes of communication all the different ways we communicate. When we say communication, we're not focusing on more and finish and wants and needs. We are saying the child needs to focus on communicating for all these reasons. Asking questions, greeting, commenting, expressing likes, dislikes, indicating there's a problem, complaining, showing preferences, making requests. Well, that's the first thing. Which one do you want? That's what we teach. We forget about all this. Are we teaching the child to tell jokes? Are we telling them they can share a secret? Are we giving instructions all the time or are we giving the child a way to give instructions? If I have complex communication needs and very little control over my life, one of the best things I can do is boss people around. And if I can do it with loud voice output, that's even better. 
but I need a way to do it. And down the bottom, it did, this is in no particular order, down the bottom, which you can't really see, is academics. I need to be able to communicate for my academics. I need a way to understand what I'm learning and being taught, and I need a way to be able to show you that I'm learning it and to be able to ask questions about it and get you to tell me more about certain things than others. I need to be able to communicate intelligibly, specifically. I need to be able to have the word that I want. I don't want to be given, was that good or bad? I might want to say, that was absolutely, totally disgusting. <laughs> and I need that, I have that right to have specific words available to me. It needs to be efficient. I shouldn't have to crawl three rooms down in order to tell mum in the kitchen what I want. I need an efficient way, wherever I am, of being able to communicate in all these different ways. And I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that we can give it a burl, give it a go, sorry. <laughs> um, we need to say needs because rather than saying nonverbal, we're saying my child has needs. Sometimes my child needs support to be understood. Sometimes my child needs support to understand. And communication support and intervention is a need. It is not a dream. It is not a wish. It is not and should never be the cherry on top of the cake. It is the cake. It is your child's right. It is a need and it is a human right. So if your speech path is put in communication, either right at the top once we've talked about dysphagia and all sorts of other things, no. You know what? We can work on swallowing, but we also need communication because I'm not sorting out swallowing and then working on communication. It is not a communication want, it's a need, like love and shelter. And doing nothing is not an option, because that's what leads to challenging behaviours. If we want a life worth living, doing nothing is not an option. And I know you all know this. When we, think of, when we know what the needs of the child are, we can think more clearly about what their goals are going to be and what the interventions. And when we say needs with an S, we can more better get our therapists and teachers to accept that it's not just one thing. We don't just have more and finish or I don't just work, I want to work on commenting or it's not that we want to work on yes and no or that we're really jiggly and we can't access the Dynavox properly. We have needs, multiple, and they all need to be addressed. Not in the same month, not in the same year, but they're going to be there. When we say needs, we're saying we accept that the child has varied, complex, tricky, unique, amazing things going on, but their needs for communication are significant and they are complex and we need to do something about them. So that is why. If a person has complex communication needs, how can they communicate? If I can't use speech, how am I going to communicate? And that's when you'll hear this term either thrown at you as a mum who's entered disability land or a dad that's Googled communication, augmentative and alternative communication, AAC. Augmentative means to increase or supplement, alternative means instead of. So basically it just encompass, encompasses everything that your child needs in order to meet his communication needs <coughs> without speech. Why bother? Well, we need AAC if the person is to meet her varied communication requirements, again, as intelligibly, specifically, efficiently, independently and in a socially valued manner. And this is the long-term goal, to be able to say what I want to say, to whoever I want to say it, when I want to say it. It's a long-term goal. I'm not saying you're going to leave here tomorrow and have all the answers, 
This is the goal though. We're talking about autonomy in my life, being able to say what I want to say. Not that it's good or bad or yummy or yucky, but that it was totally hideous and she shouldn't have worn that brooch with that dress because that was wrong. <laughs> okay? Look at all these things that we've talked about. This is what I need to say to whoever I want to say it to, whenever I want to say it, all these different things. <clears throat> and I need multiple modes. We choose the most effective method to get our message across. I want to go on to everything your child does as communication needs to be accepted. For hello, your child might wave, vocalise, use words or word approximations. They might go up and hug someone, shake hands. They might use their communication book to say, g'day, how are you, point, point, point. They might use speech generating device and be able to greet using a voice on an AAC system. When we think about drink, your child might bring you a cup. They might go to the tap and stand there and try and turn the tap on. They might stand at the fridge, knowing that if I stand here long enough, someone's going to know what I'm on. <laughs> but it's communication. They might grab Dad's hand and drag him to the cupboard where the pop tops are or the soda is, because Dad lets me have them. <laughs> with Mum, I just bring her my one special cup, but with Dad, I take him to the cupboard. <laughs> I might be able to sign drink. I might use my words or word approximations, but this multiple modes. Now, if I'm in the kitchen with my mum and my communication system is in the lounge room, is it efficient for me to go out into the lounge room to shout out drink or am I better off having been taught and being shown that I can just go and get a cup or I can go ah, and mum will look at me and say, what do you want? And I look at the tap. That's efficient. You know, if, if Erin gives me a glare or goes, that's efficient communication. I'm not telling her, Erin, you should have used your book. <laughs> okay? That was, that's what we do to the kids. Oh, you're signing drink. Tell me with your book. Very quickly, that sign for drink disappears. Very quickly, the desire to communicate disappears because I've learnt it's not about what I want or I want to say, it's about pleasing you and using that stupid book. <laughs> I want to talk about the myths of AAC. AAC is a last resort. It's a myth. If your child has complex communication needs, they need AAC now. <clears throat> AAC stops or hinders further speech development? No. The more language I have access to and are able to use and the more people use that language system with me, the more I start to understand about language. And if I'm pointing to something and I'm going, abba, 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 if I don't have the symbol bath to point to, nobody's understanding me. I'm just sitting there going, abba, abba, abba. But if I'm pointing to bath on my communication book and someone says, oh, you want a bath, that's right, ba, ba, bath. I'm going to start going, oh, that worked. I can do that and I can also do this. So language begets language. Children must have a certain set of skills to be able to benefit from AAC. <laughs> no. There are no prerequisites for AAC. The only prerequisite is that you need something to help you get your message across. You don't need to be able to jump through hoops. You don't need to be able to touch anything. You don't need a yes and no. You don't even need to be able to sit up or follow my eye gaze or really understand that you're a separate person to me because I am going to use AAC and use language to teach you all this. Um, and I just want to talk, I want to show you, 
Um, before I do that, I just want to show you a video of Will. Um, where am I? Okay, this is Will. He's not yet two. Everything in his life, every expert says he's not ready for AAC. But you know what? He has Angelman syndrome, he has complex communication needs, and he needs AAC. Can you just push play, please, Erin? Hi, Mary Louise is up here. Yeah, using your voice, should we play a game? Oh, using your voice, and yes. Not in your, yes, not in your head, and using your voice. All right, what game should we play? Can you stop that, please, Erin? Now, Will, Will doesn't know he's nodding his head when he does this. I just say, oh, you're nodding your head, you're saying yes. Will doesn't know yet that when he looks up at me, that's his way, that's a good way of affirming. Oh, you're looking up at me, you're saying yes. I teach him that by using that language when I talk with him. He's, he learns that through how I speak to him. And when we talk about prerequisites for learning, Will doesn't really show any of this. He doesn't show the, and we'll go boop, boop, boop over here. All right. So a child like Will probably would not be given a very complex communication book. But because I'm considered crazy, that's what I do. Can you please press play? <coughs> You're waiting. You're waiting for me. Okay, stop, Erin. Okay. Will doesn't know that that red symbol there means wait. He's probably only seen it three times. A speech pathologist might say, that's a fluke. You know what? Unless I say to him, oh, when you touch that you're saying wait, he's not going to learn. I can't give him this and magically expect that he knows this language. I have to use it to talk to him and feed back to him with it and the only way he's going to learn is that any time he touches something, oh, yes, you're waiting. Can you press press play, please? Waiting, yes. Shall we hurry up? Saying, hurry up, Mary Louise. We go inside. Yes, bending forward. And pause. Hurry up. Okay. Now, Will has very low tone. He's not in a very good supported position. He's trying to nod his head because I've been living with Will for a week now and he's kind of figured out that this crazy lady has some stuff going on. <laughs> but he can't nod his head in this position, so he's doing this. So I'd feed back to him, oh, you're leaning forward, you're saying yes, trying to nod your head. I'm respecting that he has all these multiple modes of things to do and I'm not saying to him, you need a certain level of intellect, prerequisites or a checklist before I'm going to do this with you. Because if you cannot speak, you need a different language system and that's not more finish. It's a language system. So that is Will on probably the, th mm, the third time we'd even used that. And he just, he's just like, oh yeah, you can pat this. And she just keeps talking. <laughs> but that's what happens. We don't talk to infants when they're babies, knowing that their first word will probably be mum or dad or mama or baba. We don't only say mama or baba for the first year of their life. We say everything. We push language on them. We surround them with language. And that's why a language system is important because William is going to need his mum and his dad and his teacher to have a whole system. So everything they want to say is there. And if it's not there, they can scribble it on a list. Speech generating AAC devices are only for children with intact cognition. <laughs> Again, 
How do you know what a child is thinking? How are you testing them? It's a myth. If your child has complex communication needs, they need alternative and augmentative communication. And if they are hearing a speech generating device, like an app on an iPad or a Dynavox or a Vantage or any of the other one, um, specific speech generating devices, they're hearing language in output. That's what they need. Children have a certain age. Well, we've discussed that with William. If you have complex communication needs from the day you're born, you need an alternative language system from the day you are born. We don't say to someone who's had a stroke, you need to wait five years, and if you're still in this situation, then I'll help you with your communication. No, if a person with a stroke cannot communicate, we say, we better give you away. It is criminal that we make children wait five years and wait till they prove by headbanging and having tantrums that they have something to say. Okay, if you can't develop AAC, you can't de how can you develop language without AAC? We are waiting for this spontaneous combustion of skill. We are waiting for the child to suddenly walk into the speech paths office and go, I'm ready. <laughs> it's not going to happen. There are some of our children who will take months and years of receptive input before they realise they can do it. But they're never going to express anything unless we give something in. And seriously, what have we lost if it takes them five years to say something expressively? Have we lost anything? No. But if we do not do something for that five years, what have we done? We have just hit home to that child, and I'm talking to the speech pass here among the parents and the teachers and the experts, that that is where the damage occurs. But it's not the end of the world if your child doesn't have a system now. Because from now on, boom, everything's changing. I want to talk about the representational hierarchy because a lot of families here will have something called objects of reference. And that's where you've probably got a ball for when your child wants to go ball or a spoon that you give your child when it's dinner time. Many parents refer to them as missiles. Um, <laughs> And there is this mistaken belief that was taught by speech paths a long time ago that you need to start with objects. When you understand that a cup is a cup, then you can move to a photograph of a cup. When you understand that a colour photograph of a cup is a cup, you can move to a black and white photograph of a cup. Then I'm going to give you an eeny weeny little cup and only if you have proven over three months, five years, 20 years, that you can get to here, can I give you a symbol. It's nonsense, it has been debunked as a myth. Because what it does is it stops language. If a child has complex communication needs and doesn't use speech, cannot use speech, they need a whole language system that is an alternative language system and one of the best ones we have is symbols. They are not cartoons. We are not saying, because you have special needs, you need these special little pretty cartoons to communicate. No, we are saying that symbols is a language, adults use it, and words. We wait for all of this before we give the children words and text and letters and teaching how to be literate. Well, you know what? Yes, it's great that I know a cup is a cup and when I'm in the bathroom and I want to clean my teeth but there's too much toothpaste in my mouth afterwards and I want to drink and I give mum a cup. And she knows, yeah, I know that's a cup. But also, I might use my symbols. Anything we want is good but a language is this. You cannot have a full language set of these. You would be carrying around a trailer 
<laughs> I'm sure a lot of you have books where some of the children, you might have like a cosy shack, um, not cosy shack, cosy snack, what's it called? What do you call it here? Yeah, like the little pudding thing. And the teacher will cut the, cut the little container in half and stick it on a piece of paper and the kid has to choose between that. Well, no. If we map language onto symbols or words, it's just as meaningful. Um, right, representational hierarchy, just want to hit it home, it's a myth. Okay, so if you go into your speech path's office and she says, you know what, we need to start with objects, and say, wrong answer, that's a myth. I know about the representational hierarchy because I am an informed parent as an advocate for my child. My child needs more, my child needs language. Thank you very much, let's move on. End of discussion. Okay. It is difficult to determine what concepts and vocabulary any child understands because judgments are made on the basis of his or her performance. That's what we're saying. What we're saying is, because of what you can do physically, I'm judging what you can do in here. No. We already know the children don't test well. They can smell a test a mile away. But then the tester comes in wearing a paisley shirt and everything goes out and then the tester says, touch the red one. And they're like, well, the red one is in front of your red squiggly shirt and it's gone or I know that's the red one, but my arm won't touch it. My arm won't move. But you just know that if you said to your kid, I reckon there's Cheerios in that red one, boom, they'd have it. <laughs> but that's not on the test script. So it doesn't count. We can't judge this, the intellect, based on this. We can teach this to more likely reflect this, but we can't judge it. Here we go. During early phases of development, it may not matter if the child uses abstract or iconic symbols because to the child they all function the same. What it matters is what language you map onto it. Some people will look at the symbol for clever in the board maker symbols and it's of a little guy, little face with a graduating hat. And some teachers will say, my children are never going to graduate, I don't want to use that symbol. It doesn't matter what the symbol is, it's the language we put onto it. Some people will say, well, that soup doesn't look like the soup that we use, that he likes, so if I change it, no, this is a language, this is an internationally recognised language, what matters is that every time you say, we're having soup for dinner, you map language onto that picture. It doesn't matter that the symbol for grandma doesn't really look like grandma. What matters is that every time you go to grandma's, every time you talk about grandma, every time you ring grandma, you use that symbol. It's all about language. Uh, again, everything is accepted. If I start a mass communication intervention and you bring me a cup, I'm not going to say, your communication book that I spent three weeks laminating is in your bedroom. <laughs> you need to go and get it. Not about that. It's multiple modes. I do the best, the most efficient thing for me in that moment because you respect I have multiple modes of communicating. Many of our children are labelled pre-intentional or pre-symbolic and the speech pathologist or teacher says your child is pre-intentional, I can't do anything yet, come back when he shows intent to communicate. This is what they, um, they mean by pre-intentional, that behaviour is not under the individual's own control, but it reflects his general state. Comfortable, uncomfortable, hungry, and that the caregivers interpret the individual's state using from their body movements, facial expressions and sound. In typically developing children, this stage occurs between zero and three months. Now, what breaks my heart is when I go to a conference full of parents of adults and somebody talks about pre-intentional communication and the, the parents of the adults are going, I still have to do this. I still have to interpret my child's movements 
and facial expressions. My child must have the intellect of this. No, because this is for typically developing children. Okay. There are significant issues when using this term with have, when we have children who have motor challenges, sensory processing issues. They have difficulty learning to express intentional and conventional movements. They have difficulty saying for drink. They have difficulty going, oh, when they've got a headache. So yes, you do have to interpret for them longer than a typical child would, but they are not stuck at zero to three months. It means that they have complex communication needs and motor planning issues and sensory processing issues and they need a different way of communicating. Their pathways are different. They are not stuck at zero to three months. The difficulties may lie in interpreting. I might know what a child does. I might be able to interpret from, for my, the kids in my class much easier than when a relief teacher comes in. Or much like Finn's mum can interpret for her much easier than, than interpret for Finn much easier than when an auntie visits from overseas. Doesn't mean that Finn's stuck at zero to three months. It means that Finn's mum is so in tune with him that Finn now needs to learn other ways of showing other people how he communicates. He is not stuck at zero to three months simply because his mum knows exactly what he wants and can read his facial expressions and his body movements. I really want you to take that home. Okay. Instead of using pre-intentional, let's say we can communicate with a child in a form of language that they can communicate back to us with. If I've got a child who cannot express conventional gestures because of their motor planning issues, then I need to communicate to them in a way that they can learn to communicate back to me. Speech isn't going to happen. It is cruel for me to expect that. It is cruel for me to only talk to them. We can use our understanding regarding motor planning issues, sensory processing issues, to set behaviours accordingly, but we're not going to use this term. Okay. The problem is that professionals intervene and provide language or aided language or symbols or objects based on their expectations of what's possible. And as Erin talked about, if your expectations are down here, you're going to intervene at this level. The children can only demonstrate what we set up for them to use. So if we're going open expectations, let's just see how we go. We're going to provide this aided language environment. We're going to give lots and lots of chatting to you in a way that you can chat back to me. That's going to be a different ending to when I give you a symbol for more and finish. That's all you're going to be able to show me you can do. Okay, see potential. <coughs> Believe. Believe in the child. See it once. Believe it. It was not a fluke. Some, somehow, everything you had taught that child Every part of that motor planning and sensory processing, everything came together for that magic moment and you saw it. It doesn't mean it didn't happen if it only happens once a year. It did happen. What you need to do now is think, right, that happened. How can I make it so that that can happen again? What was there in the environment for my child that bridged the gap between biology and function so that my child could do that. Let's analyse it. Was he wearing a weighted vest? Was he having a chewy tube? Was it just that he was having a seizure-free day? I don't know, but we can at least give it a burl. Open expectations. I'm not going to limit that child by putting low expectations. My expectations are open. It's not that they're super high, and I believe that everything is possible and we're all going to do PhDs. I can't be bothered, plus I've got a library farm at uni and they won't let me back. 
So I have open expectations. I don't know what the future is going to hold. I don't know what is possible, but I'm going to give interventions and make goals to create more opportunities for you. Opportunities and experience and autonomy versus independence. Autonomy, it's about saying what I want to say, when I want to say it, to who I want to say it to. Um, and it is okay to have assistance to become an autonomous communicator. There's a difference between independence and autonomy. Independent, yes, I might be able to touch it myself, I might be able to touch the iPad myself and go, chocolate, 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 chocolate. But who programmed that on there? Do I really mean chocolate or do I mean chocolate mousse? Do I have a way of saying chocolate mousse? I just want to show you Alex. Um, Okay, so this is Alex, and Alex was part of our adult communication groups. Um, and Alex's mum, Sue, is wearing a stripy top. Alex's dad is in the blue. And Laura, who's my um, chief second in charge, and I'm her chief second in charge. Um, and when we problem solve we, and something goes wrong, then we do say, no, it's not us. Um, <laughs> She uh, is from England, so you'll have to get used to another accent. And Laura is, has the blonde fringe and she's going to be scanning the communication book for Alex. And the situation is that um, in group, Laura has said, I wonder if anyone has something from this week they want to share. Um, yeah, okay. Right, I'll go back. Okay, so Alex has sensory processing issues and his perseveration is his mmm, mmm, mmm. That's what you'll hear. He needs to do that in order to communicate with me. If I ask him to turn it off, he stops being able to think. So I need to value that and respect that. And yes, we can work on later on, but this is his third time using a complex communication book. When we started, his mum's goal was for Alex to have a clear yes and no and a way for him to tell people things. Um. To eat and drink. Wanted to eat and drink. So yes, says... So Alex was getting stressed. He was trying to tell Laura, but he didn't know where it was in the book that he wanted to tell her. So I said, all right, Alex, would you like me to scaffold you to the page that you need? Because he'd already told me what he'd done. And he said, yes. So I am supporting him to become an autonomous communicator. I'm not stealing his turn. I'm not saying, Laura, guess what Alex did? I'm saying, I'm going to give you a bit of help because if I ask you to start from the beginning again, that's mean. Yes, says Alex. Yeah. Now, do you want to tell Laura from here? Mm. Would you like to finish telling me? Mm. Yeah, okay. Little words, food, drink, drink, something's wrong. Yeah. Mm. Little words. Mm. She's reading out on the page, which has as many symbols as this. Can you see this? And in this first column, it says little words. I, you, not, don't, can't, eat, drink, want, little words like that. And then it will move down to food, because he's, he's on the food page. Um, so Laura is reading out 
Little words, food, eat, whatever they are. He says yes to little words. So she reads out the words that are in that column. I, yes. What you can see Alex doing is kind of going, uh, yeah, I thought it was that one, but it's not. So when it's a yes, he will give a clear yes. This is the third group, the third time in his life, as someone in his late 20s, he has used a clear yes and no. He's also using a book that he has only seen twice before. So he is relying on his auditory knowledge and his language of speech and his, his intellect to communicate. He had no other way before. He finds it very difficult to touch, so he's someone that you say, touch the blue, and he can't. He's someone that you say, touch food, and he can't. He might really want to say food, but he can't. So he's had nothing. But this is what he can do when someone else scans the words for him. Um. What? Nothing, Laura's just moving on. Say no, not that word. so used to being the one that gives her message, she can't help it. She's like, yes, that's the one. You did. You ate. And Alex's message was, I ate. For the first time in my life, at home by myself, right, with no one else helping me, I ate. He was asked, what did you do this week? I ate. Yes. And he got his message out himself. So Alex is on a learning journey on communication and so is his mum. Um, I want to show you another one about him. All right, this one, show, this one shows a bit more about why Alex hasn't been given any um, communication systems. Okay, press go or play. We're trying to get the best here. Like it was, you know, so go for it. Whatever you want to do. Okay, whatever you want to do, mate. Yes, yes I want to do it. I want to touch that. I'm moving down a little. Oh, I'm trying. No. Oh. Okay, okay can you fine. press stop? Okay. okay. Now, if someone doesn't understand about sensory processing issues, what they interpret it as, I've changed my mind, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to talk. But when you understand about sensory processing issues and motor planning and that I really want to do this, but I can't. Yes, he's saying, yes, I do want to do this, but I can't. What he's done is make a movie on his iPad with his mum and his support worker and some other cool people and he's desperate to share it but everything that's going on and his intense desire to share it is blocking him. He's now got that apraxia of I want to do it so much I can't. So we really need to be mindful that if you see this in kids, sometimes yes they have changed their mind, I don't want to do it but they're more likely to go push it away or throw it, <laughs> or pull your hair. But if you see this, this is sensory stuff. This is, I want to do it so bad that I just can't. And this is when you step in as a scaffolding and supportive person to go, it's all right, would you like me to have a turn? Would you like me to help you? Always respectfully, would you like me to press play? You are not grabbing his hand to touch it because you have stolen his turn. He showed you, he communicated that he was desperately trying to do it, but 20 years of not being able to do it cannot be overridden in three minutes. It's gonna be a long process. But if I say, 
Or if Laura says, I can see you're having some problems, would you like me to do it and maybe you can talk about it later? Yes, okay. Um, okay, if you, oh, I, think I, I think I closed down my presentation too, so that would be helpful. Um, yes, go for it. So we have a question from the online audience. They would like to know if it's okay to teach their children more than one language. So if they speak Spanish in the home and English, is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hang on, I'll get into... Um, and if they go onto the Angelman listserv or into Facebook, they will find families who are teaching their children more than one language. And we probably have some families in the room. Um, okay. There's much jubilation online. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. But if you're teaching your child more than one language and your child has complex communication needs, what can be really helpful is if you're using symbols, write the English and the Greek or the English and the German, or the Arabic and the Spanish, because you want Nana to be able to use this as much as school does. And if Nana can only read English and, or Spanish or Arabic, and Nana has no idea what these squiggles are, but you're saying, just look for the word, then we want her to have success. So absolutely go for two languages, because that's part of your family and your child is a part of your family more than he is Angelman. But go online to get more resources. Um, I want to quickly talk about Eli who you talked about who you saw before. Eli is very much, I want to say what I want to say, when I want to say it to who I want to say it to. Oh, thank you. Eli is not afraid to tell you that. He's very in your face. Um, He's not backwards in coming forwards. Uh, Eli's mum said to him, Eli, you're getting a new communication book. It's going to be wicked cool. It's going to have so many words. L we need to organise where all your people go because you've got so many people in your life. You've got music people and work people and your friends that you live with. And, and then she finally got to Mary Louise and she said, where do you want Mary Louise? You know, because... Is she a friend? And he went, mm. <laughs> Is Do you want her in like your Angelman communication group people? He's like, eh. Do you want her in like therapists? No. Do you want her in teachers? No, even though he does say I'm clever. Thank you very much, Eli. <laughs> and he said, creamy. Cheesy cheesecake. <laughs> that is my name now. It is an intense honour to be on the food page <laughs> for Eli, okay? I've been called lots of things in my life. Creamy cheesy cheesecake is one of my favourites. In class I was mwee. Um, Mm, we, mm, we. Loved that. Also on the first day of teaching, I had a um, five-year-old sit there with his Dynavox. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, <laughs> hurry up. I said, what do you want to hurry up? I'm very good at playing dumb. What do you want to hurry up? Do you want me to hurry up? Do you want school to hurry up? I don't know. And I was using my pod book to say, I don't know what you want. I don't know. This was his language, therefore I used it to talk to him. He was using his Dynavox, but he also had his communication book there as well. And he looked at me, and he's five, deletion positive angelman. He looked at me and he went, people. Went to his people page and looked and thought, you're not on here. No, 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 turn the page, woman. <laughs> hurry up woman, hurry up woman, hurry up woman. <laughs> that was five years ago, I am still woman. <laughs> I get birthday Facebook posts from the family, happy birthday woman. <laughs> so 
So this is autonomous communication. Creamy, cheesy cheesecake. Last night, it was, it was last night I Skyped with Eli and um, I said, Eli, have I got permission to show any videos? I forgot to ask you before I left. And we've worked a lot on um, uh, informed consent for videos with our adults. And he was like, oh, if I have to, yes, you can do that. And his mum, Jackie, started, she just kept talking. And he's on his AAC app called, no, it's a, like a sound effects app. And his sound effects app called Big Button Box and he's going blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so that's autonomous communication. That's age appropriate. I'm 22. If you rang for me, that's fine, but we're done. Don't talk to my mum. So creamy cheesy cheesecake had to hang up. Okay, motor planning issues, we've talked about that. We're engineering our kids for success. It's much better they have three seconds of success and we respond to that than they have a whole day of struggle. Okay, we've got proprioceptive, vestibular, perseveration, attention span. Again, back to Alex. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, but I just can't. And I want to show you Harry because Harry is a classic. This is Harry, age five. Yeah, more. Yeah. You're looking at Katie having a drink and you're telling more. Would you like more? Me too. Okay. Sorry, can you hear that? No. So he's very good with his yes and no, you'd think. He's got his yes, he can nod his head, he can say yeah, he can say no. Move it on a bit. Want to bounce, jump. Oh, I get a bit distracted because I love you. Need to do something. Mary Louise. Right. Now this is a class of supposedly non-verbal children. It'll be very hard to hear me and Harrison because there's lots of other people in the background. But we know they're not non-verbal. They have complex communication needs. Um, okay. Here we go. Looking at me. Oh. Is that your message? Is that right? Well, you need more, but it's to turn the page. Okay, so, uh, what am I doing? I'll just have a look at my fingers. Uh, yes, I actually do want to turn the page. Right, that's the important part. If I had shown you that bit of Harrison nodding his head, saying, yeah, I can do this, I'm clearly communicating. If I had just shown you that, everyone's like, oh, high functioning. You need to see all the motor planning go out the window and the sensory stuff come in for you to go, right, we're still on a learning curve. It happens sometimes and not other times. But what's important is that Harry is learning, I sit still so Mary Louise can understand me. I've said yes, I've said no, now my body is still. Um. Okay, so we, when we're talking about cortical vision impairment, I want to quickly talk about, these are the goals you often see will match name to photograph, will identify symbol from a field of two, will attend to. And that usually means will visually attend to. But what we know is that if I'm attending to a story, I might have to turn my head away. So the vision teacher might have a different goal to the teacher and to the speech pathologist. But communication trumps all. 
will identify symbol of a field of two. If they're just presented like this, cat, dog, they don't mean anything. There's no language on them. If I just have to identify pictures, I have to remember a lot of pictures that don't mean anything. And all I'm doing is performing monkey tricks for you. It's not language for me. Something like this might be better for a child with cortical vision impairment because the symbols are so much brighter than that. I might be able to make more sense of those images and see them clearly and quickly look out the corner of my eye and develop my motor planning if I have this. But I'm not saying point to the green face. Every time I go, <coughs> don't like that one, I'm touching that. I'm mapping language on. Um, when you are given, we'll identify something, something from a field of two. We'll match name to photograph. This is what you get. Student inconsistently looks at options. Student's eye gaze is too quick or fleeting to interpret. That's not the kid's fault. If my processing is going so super fast and all I can do is go, flick, I know which one it is, that's great. If you are waiting for me to turn my head and look at what you're doing, you're not respecting me and how I work. Student demonstrates maladaptive behaviour when presented with communication choices. Read that as chuck them across the room <laughs> because they don't mean anything. Student does not consistently identify symbols. Ugh. Right, sensory motor issues need lots and lots and lots of this. I want you to just really think about what we're asking kids to do. Sensory motor demands, motivation, strength, motor planning, muscle tone, endurance, motor automaticity, filtering, processing, scanning. That's the sensory stuff. Then we're asking for cognitive demands, discriminating, making choices, problem solving, motivation. And then we're putting language on the top of it. Processing language, being motivated to do what I want you to do, having a relationship to me, realising why we're doing this. Is it no wonder some of them just sit there and go... And someone says, mm, low functioning. No, look at what you're asking me to do. Take some of it out and I might be able to have some success. Consistently inconsistent. See it once and believe it. Stick that to your child's file and says, Mary Louise will throw a communication system at them if they don't accept it. The happy demeanour often interferes with communication. The laughing reflex. Someone falls over and I burst out laughing. So people assume I think it's funny when they fall over, when really I might be really concerned. I don't know, I can't think. What, I don't know what's going on in your mind. It's a bang, huge bang in the classroom. Someone pulls over the bookshelf. Four kids start laughing. But it's not a, that was really funny laugh. It's the, oh my God, what was that laugh? Or it's, I'm going to have a seizure soon laugh. <coughs> Ask experts in Angelman, experts, about different laughs of children with Angelman, they will often give you a blank look. Ask parents how many different laughs their child has. One when he's really happy, one when he's playing with grandpa, one when he goes to say hello to someone, one when he's in the cupboard doing something that he knows he shouldn't be doing <laughs> and he can't believe he hasn't been caught yet. And then there's the one when I know something's wrong. It's the manic sick we're on the verge of a seizure, something's wrong. So unless your people in your child's life know about this, that laughter is communication and there, is, there are different laughs and it's not all about happiness, then that can really interfere with your child's communication. Laughing is not a way of saying yes. We can start with it because we accept everything at the beginning, but we need to work on another way. Because if a child is telling me that he has pain and his only way of saying yes is to laugh, that's cruel. If a child is telling me that his dog died 
and his only way of saying yes is to smile and laugh, that's really difficult. If his overwhelming feeling is sadness and I'm asking him to laugh and smile and tell me yes if it's that one, did your dog die? <laughs> what messages am I sending? I have found that nearly everyone I work with, the, the adults and children, have been taught if they really have very poor control over their voice that they can learn to push a laugh out in order to get some voice. We have worked on, uh, uh, hi, I'm pushing my laugh out to get my, uh, 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 hi, or I have to get my body ready, I have to get my body going, and then my voice and my laugh might come on, and then I can say, yeah. And eventually, I don't have to do this much. I can just go, yeah. Or like Harry, I can just go, yeah. But that just doesn't happen for some kids like that. We need to teach them. Challenging behaviour, robust tools. You might hear angel proof. Um, crying is often seen as a challenging behaviour because it doesn't fit with the happy angel. Passivity, some kids just go with the flow. Many of our younger children go with the flow. They will do ABA, but they hit about seven and then suddenly they're not passive anymore. They have no motivation or they need more and more food motivators. It doesn't work anymore. And so suddenly they have challenging behaviours. Nobody has actually put in communication stuff since they were little when they were passive and happy and loving. So when they hit this challenging seven, eight, nine, ten, or God forbid puberty, then we have to think about challenging behaviour, communication intervention. So it's not just about a kid's going to be passive for life. And what I worry about with passivity is that it is learned helplessness in a lot of our adults. We special edify so many of our adults so that they won't do anything of their own intrinsic motivation. They have become passive because they won't do anything unless we say, stand up, walk out, sit. So they just think, oh well, you're just going to tell me what to do anyway, so I'll just sit here. It's about building a life for our people and passivity as a child, of going with the flow, that's great. But we have to be really careful that we don't let that be a, I'm just going to sit like a lump. And special ed can be very good at breeding lumps. Sensory processing issues versus challenging behaviour. Really get um, a sensory profile done so you can say to your child's teacher, I really want to work out what's what. There might be some crossover, but I think we need to work together to work out what's what. And control language. When children stop being passive and start trying to exhibit some control over their life, the adults step up their control language. Stop. Sit down. Stay still. Wait but the child doesn't get any control language. The child doesn't get a go away. The child doesn't get a help. I don't understand what I'm doing, help me. And what I have found with even my little, little people is that they know that they are the only person in their life that needs help. Their two-year-old sister can often do more than they can do. What we need to show is how they can be helpers and how other people in their life need help. So if your child is the one when they start and something gets too hard and they start headbanging and they, everything loses the plot, that's when you not need to start saying, oh, Dad, I'm having some real problems here. This is really tricky. I think I'm going to start screaming, help, help. Start signing, using the symbol. Help, help, I'm asking for help. Talk about what you're doing. I need help. And Dad can come in, it's all right, I can help you. Oh, Harry, now you're five, I really need your help with this because you can do this and I need your help. Your child needs a role as a helper as much as he needs a way of saying that other people need help. 
because they don't see these things by osmosis. Unless sometimes we say, I need help, I'm really struggling, or like my classic is putting myself in time out when everything's gone pear-shaped in the classroom and suddenly everything goes really quiet and you, the kids are looking like, does she know she's on that chair? <laughs> and I sit there and say, oh, I'm so glad I put myself on a break because I was going to start screaming and I just needed a break. And then it becomes acceptable. I know what I can do when I'm about to scream. I can go there. And if a grown-up does it and nobody laughs at her or says, stop, sit down, it must be okay. Children need a way of saying go away that isn't pulling hair and isn't slapping someone. And it must be respected. So either it's, it's page one on your communication book or something, it's, or even if it's just that, that starts off as a whack. Oh, you're pushing me away. You're saying, go away. Sure, I'll go away. Very soon they'll say, oh, that's powerful. All I have to do is that. Um, we need continuity across environment. We need skilled and positive people. Challenging behaviour leads to more adult control, which leads to more challenging behaviour. Skill, skill, skill. <coughs> Upskill everyone. I'm going to move through that. I want to talk about aided language stimulation because there is no point using symbols or a Dynavox or any type of aided language until, unless you know about aided language stimulation. The Dynavox or the speech output device or the iPad is the tool. It is the thing. Aided language stimulation, sorry, is the strategy of how you are going to help your child understand what to do with the tool. This is what we, we do with typical kids. We speak to them, they get spoken language in, and spoken language comes out and everyone's happy. This is what we do to kids most of the time with special needs and complex communication needs. We speak to them and we expect aided language with symbols or Dynavox to come out. And I'm not um, bashing Dynavox, I'm just knowing that a lot of people here have kids who use Dynavox. Um, this leads to this, and this doesn't happen. Aided language doesn't happen. If we want language, aided language, AAC, aided language is anything that I'm using to aid my language. Symbols, signing. If I sign, my child learns that's language and my child learns to sign. If I use symbols, my child uses that, out. Receptive in, expressive out. And it takes time. We don't expect typical children to do this until they've had at least 12 months of that. We cannot hand a kid a device and expect this in four weeks. Sometimes it happens. But what we need to say is we're going to do this to the best of our ability. We're going to get online on the Angelman groups because it's going to be hard work and I'm going to want to throw that thing out the window at some point. And I know there are going to be other families who can support me, but I'm going to keep going because this is what I want for my child because my child has complex communication needs and he needs another way of communicating. Uh, we know that children don't need any prerequisites. That's a sample of an aided language display. You've got one in your packet. And the idea with an aided language display is it aids my language. And this is one called a general interactive. Just a general one so I can chat with an early communicator. Someone who is learning what all this is about. They don't have to pass a test to know what the green man says. I just start using it. I don't expect anything back from them. Because as soon as I say, talk, that kid goes, no. I don't know what to do with that. I'm going to shut down. So I just start rabbiting on with it. Pretty soon they start whacking symbols here and there. And I go, oh, he's saying don't like that. Ugh, I don't like it either. Oh, stop, wait. Yes, we're waiting, William. We are, we're waiting. Oh, 
know you want something. Yeah, I do. I'm nodding my head. I'm saying I want something. Oh, I want more of that. Yeah, I want more of that too because I like it. I like it. It's awesome. I'm nodding my head. I'm saying, yes, I like it. It's language. Okay? It's aided language and I'm doing it in because that's what my child can do out. He might not be able to touch that yet, but he might be able to look at it. And I go, oh, you're looking at this. You're looking at it. I like it. You're, are you telling me I like it? Yes. Oh, you're looking back at me. You're not trying to nod your head. Yes, I like it. Brilliant. I love how you're talking with me. You can use an aided language display planner, which is in your packet. And what this helps you do is work out the language that you can put on your displays so it's not a choice making board. So you have questions, people, verbs, descriptions, in, on, big, small, and nouns. Water, ball, food. Usually it's the nouns that are on most of the kids' devices. Bubbles, balls, food, drink. But this stuff, the descriptors, big ball. And they don't have to look like um, Aaron, can you just come here, please? Okay. One size does not fit all, but you've got to start somewhere. So, I might have a student with cortical vision impairment, and I'm going to try this because I know it's got high contrast symbols, and because she's taking, having real difficulty attending to this much, I can say, oh, you want more? Sure. Oh, you're looking over here. Hmm, I like it. Yes, I like it. You're looking at this. I can bring this into her field of vision. I'm not limiting her and I never say, can you hold that? More or finish. Because that doesn't teach her where those words are and that they're just a part of something she can say. They always go back where I found them. Um, if your kid loves Velcro and the sound of it going takes away from the communication, don't use Velcro. This particular one is for a child who needs you to scan for them. So much like Alexander did, he wasn't able to use direct access to touch, but he, this child couldn't attend to this many symbols, so I would say, mm, I do me mine, uh-oh, I don't know. Oh, it's one of them, okay. I do me mine, no. Uh-oh. Yes, oh, you're saying uh-oh. Yeah, I know, I saw Becky's Coke spill too. Uh-oh. But you have to use it first if you're expecting your child to use it. There we go. Okay, you need to model. Think of yourself as a model, a beautiful, stunning model, and you model that communication. You model, 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 model. You just do it, okay? That's what you do with no expectation. Your child will use it back. You just model how to do it. Oh, yes, I do. I'm touching it. I do. Oh, you want some. You need to use it frequently, all day, every day. And I want to just have a look through, because we're running out of time. I want to talk about choice making, because this is what I see in a lot of children's homes. All right. Now, for breakfast, Brian, I've put these on your special board, cornflakes, oatmeal or toast. Touch the one you want. Brian touches cornflakes. The next day, Dad comes down, puts them like this. Cornflakes, oatmeal, toast was Mum. Oatmeal, cornflakes, toast was Dad. Yesterday, I could automatically go... Cornflakes was on that side, so I just went boom with my hand. 
Today I went to go boom to get that symbol again and it's oatmeal, so I get fed oatmeal. I don't want oatmeal. Grandma comes and she says, well, I'm not making toast, it's too hard because it goes all over the floor, so you can just have these two. <laughs> and then the speech pathologist comes and goes, I want to know what symbols you know. I'm going to do that. Show me cornflakes. Well, I'm not using up all my working memory to memorise symbols. I want language. Or we do this. Do you want cornflakes or socks for breakfast? This is true. I have seen this. Oatmeal or socks? What do you want? Preferred, non-preferred item. Or stupid item. <laughs> my goal is to make a choice from a field of two. That is my IEP goal. If I make a choice of socks for breakfast, I have made a choice. I have hit my goal. Does it make sense? Was it language? No. Not my fault. You put them up there. And what does this tell us about how we view that child's intellect? What are we saying to them? And what if they do choose socks for breakfast? Do we then say, oh yes, you got really cool socks from Nana yesterday in the post. Would you like to wear them to school? No, we don't say that. We just say, mm -hmm, X doesn't know what oatmeal is. So go back to using something like an aided language display. Everything's in the same place. I can work on getting my motor planning automatic. I can work on learning language. I can understand and learn language. Oh, what do you want for breakfast? Um, I want oatmeal. I wonder what you're going to have. Hurry up, Dad. I want oatmeal. Mm. Oh, we have to wait a minute. Oh, you're going to have cornflakes. You're saying you want cornflakes. Oh, no, we've finished the cornflakes. I know, I can see that you're crying and banging your head, but that doesn't make the cornflakes appear. Let's have a look in the cupboard and see what else there is. No, there's definitely no cornflakes. I'll show you the empty box from the bin. There's none there. I know you still want cornflakes. How about... I do, I go to the shop and get some more cornflakes. Would that help? Yes, you're nodding your head, yes. Toast, mm. yeah, you can have toast later. Oh, you want something else? Because I know the most powerful thing about language and making choices is that I might not want these three. Because I learnt yesterday at school there's something called Cheerios. <laughs> and I know that if I touch that, other stuff comes. We want conversations, language, communication, interactions. It's not choice making. It's not about more food. More food. That's the only language I can get from that Big Mac. And the problem also is that that Big Mac has no symbol on it. It has no language on it. Until I hit it, I don't know what the word is that I'm going to be saying. If I said to you, hurry up, more cornflakes, and you said, should we put that on a Big Mac for Dad? And you went, yes. And I went, let's write it. I'll say it now. Hurry up, Dad, I want more cornflakes. OK, you can use your switch when you're ready. Remember, it says, hurry up, Dad. I want more cornflakes. Then that's autonomy. That's using that tool for autonomous communication. It's meaningful. If it's just programmed with more, there's no point. It's not. This is sometimes the worst thing that has happened in special ed. They're brilliant for when children have a way of communicating, but the children need to give the message. Even if they just whack that and you go, oh, that was a fluke, or they picked a bit of tiny little bit of food off there, 
They failed their functional vision assessment because they couldn't see a great big white ball go across the room, but oh my God, they know when there's a tiny little bit of toast on their aided language display. When they touched that, you went, toast, yes. Oh, toast, okay. Language at breakfast, we can use just a gener generic display. Again, we've got all sorts of things to say on the one laminated sheet that I can sticky tape to your high chair or your table. And I've always got a way of saying something else. Um, more language. More language. Um, say what I want to say. Say what I want to say. And that's me done.